Um, hello there, uh, Secretariat. We need to share screen, please. Hi there. Um, so are, are you able are you able to do that? Do you see the the suite of buttons uh, at the bottom? Yes, I I pressed the green button, share screen, but nothing happened. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me just pull up participants list. Okay, I've made you a co-host. See if that works now. I also need co-hosting for a list of names, please. Robert Guerra, Herman Ramos, Cedric Cohen, and Jan Erbegut. I think you wrote these in an email, right? Yeah, I'll I'll yes. I'll just check that out. Just oh, can you, you can you can you confirm to me that you can share the screen? Yes, it works. Are you seeing it? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing it. Okay. Now why do I have a GF screen? I see your presentation just to let you know. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, it's, 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 appearing, it's appearing well, yeah. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so Herman Ramos, he needs to be a, a co-host as well. Let's just join us. So Herman should also have hosting abilities. I'll um, I'll just facilitate this as your as your co-presenters come in. Okay, that's great. Okay. Um, the participants have a chat, right, that they can use. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, uh, absolutely. There's a, there's, a, there's a chat function at the bottom. The thing, the funny thing with Zoom is that you don't tend to see a lot of options unless you press the the three little dots, and then right. and then that pulls up all of the various functions oh. or or many of the functions. And so the reactions see. are there too. Okay. Yes. Right.
Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. We're, we're going to uh, start in a few minutes. Uh, Secretariat uh, Yon uh, also needs to be a co-host, please. I think we'll be about five minutes uh, to start. Uh, I'm showing uh, three minutes to the start time, and then we'll be about two minutes to start this to join us. Um, IGF, please, can you add Frederick Cohen as well as a co-host? Uh, this is Amali. We're, we're just going to give a couple of more minutes. We're waiting for Robert Guerra, who is also a co Oh, Robert, you're here. Okay, excellent. excellent. I am. I just, <laughs> okay. just sent you an email. Um, excellent. And I'm just going to give one or two minutes, just in case a few others join us.
Okay, I think we're going to um, start and uh, we may have a few uh, people joining us uh, a little later and that would be fantastic. My name is uh, Amali De Silva Mitchell and I'm the coordinator for the IGS Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies. And this is a public discussion. Um, and, I, and I feel that uh, we are actually a number of us, uh, part of the coalition, um, and uh, some who are actually uh, participating with us, uh, collaborating with us on our next venture, which is a book. Uh, so welcome to everyone and welcome to those who are new to our coalition. A very, very warm welcome and thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, just oh, it's flickering. Assuming you're all seeing a flickering screen. Um, Amali, this is the secretary. We've lost your screen, in fact. Oh, you've lost my screen. Okay. Um, oh, dear. Uh, do you want me to share mine in the meantime and use Tumblr? Please, to Robert, advance? that would be fantastic. And maybe you can even run us through this. Um, that was, uh, oh, dear. I may have to, to go out and come in again. Is that better? Can everyone see my right. screen? We can see the presentation. Perfect, Amali. So just go ahead. I, I actually and then just tell me when to advance. Anything. Just tell I me when to advance. So we're on slide number one. Uh, um, I actually can't see anything. Um, Got a serious mishap happening here. Um, I would say, I think I must have completely crashed. So, Robert, oh, here we go. Um, it's not allowing me to do anything. Yeah, I can't see much on my screen other than the slides. And so, I ask you just to let me know when to advance it. And you can open a copy of the slides on your computer as well in PowerPoint. And then as you advance my... it there, then I'll advance it as well. I have actually lost my computer. Um, it's not, if my, my slides are, are written in the format that they can just be read uh, because I was trying to deal with accessibility. Robert, would you feel comfortable just reading my slides out? Um, sure, so this is uh, title slide number one. Um, just gonna reduce my screen here. So this is, Health Matters in the UN Sendai Framework, Risks and Opportunities, presented by the IGF Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies, public discussion session, October 2021. I'm moving to slide number two, which is housekeeping items, welcome and introduction to Dynamic Coalition members. And I'll let you, Amali, read those out. And uh, then you have a slide, a bullet point at the bottom, which is um, let's warm up. So I'll let you discuss that and let me know when you want me to go next. Uh, yeah, it's just flickering. I have nothing other than a completely flickering okay, screen. Okay, great. So I'd like to welcome so on behalf of Amali and myself, I'd like to thank you all for joining to this discussion forum. Great apologies for the uh, slides, which we will send you uh, afterwards. Um, I'll be um, moving the slides forward um, and uh, Amali and some of the other panelists. Um, I'm just um, I'm the backup slide person. And so um, the Dynamic Coalition members, I'm going to list the ones on the screen. Uh, it's Amali De Silva Mitchell, June Paris, myself, Robert Guerra, Frederick Cohen, Herman Ramos, and Jorg Ergbus. And apologies for the mispronunciation. I'm moving over to slide number two. And slide number two are buzzwords. How are ICTs and technology used in the healthcare situations? We hear a lot of different terms, a lot of different buzzwords. We hope that we'll get into some of the discussion about some of these and uh, words that you'll see on the screen, monitoring, censoring, delivery, internet of things, AI, information, misinformation, mobile functionality and reach, power supplies, particularly now supply chains, whether they're related to manufactured good, PPE and other things and medication, the internet, um, Interoperability, wearables, ambulance technology, data gathering, storage analysis, used reporting. These are a lot of some of the uh, terms 
And this is a much smaller term of ones that have been used um, related to IC2 technologies um, in healthcare situations. Going to the next slide, some additional buzzwords that we've been hearing, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and these are situations around these particular words that we really need to plan for. And what are some of these words that, that really triggering the need to have a comprehensive plan around them? Whenever we hear the word pandemic, is there a response plan and things like that? If there's an emergency, if there is a local quote breakout, if the situation is normal, if one wants to build an inclusive health situation, diversity risk managed situation, protection, preventative, enhance, patient specific, sorry, patient centered specific health, and all terms that have been used for a long time that we need to develop situations for well is the long used term of telemedicine, remote surgery, and wellness. Moving over to the next slide. Um, so I'll leave it maybe, um, I'll, I'll say these, these are, um, and we're going to be referring this dynamic coalition in this presentation and this discussion is going to be referring to the Sendai framework. As many of you probably know, the UN Sendai framework for disaster risk recovery, um, which comes under the auspices of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015. And previous to that, it was known as the Helical Framework. Its aim, as always, is to assist the meeting um, to um, the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. And this came because there was an earthquake in Japan and a whole bunch of other things, and has been proven to be a lot more relevant now because of the pandemic. And um, something that I'll mention as well is in the Sunday framework, there are a lot of issues that um, it encompasses. Um, such as disasters, but also accessibility to those with um, disabilities as well. In the um, Sendai framework, disasters may take many different forms. They could be environmental, political, health related, such as COVID-19 that we're going through right now, technological, security issues, electrical outages that impact communications and the proper functioning of our ever connected um, world, systems and devices, and there's a problem and the risks when we're not prepared. Um, in regards to business continuity, what is that? Um, as you can all see and probably can imagine, but there is a very specific uh, definition in the Sendai framework. Business continuity is the ability for an entity to continue its operations when shocks occurs to its system. So in the case of hospitals, which is key for health, is the ability for the hospitals, the doctors, and the practices that are involved, such as telemedicine and associated health services such as dentists to be able to still work with the technologies that they have. So can the imaging department still take a picture of, um, of patients? Can dentists take pictures of your tooth? Can pharmacies order medication, see what their supplies are and keep the patient record so they can keep on servicing the people and the livestock and other um, type of communities that they care for as well. Now, vulnerability is the Achilles heel of a system. It can be the weakest point, um, a gap in the system or a lock in the security, poor data. Um, and so that's something that we always have to identify. And what is risk management? Risk management, it allows for the planning and the prediction of situations. So we have, can have continuous monitoring so as to minimize risk before a crisis occurs so that business continuity is maintained. So it's identifying the scenarios as well so we can plan through them and not have to go through a chaotic situation to try to figure out what's going on. But if we have a risk management plan, then we just implement that plan right away. And this is related to resilience. Um, in developing systems, in this case, healthcare systems, they're not just focused on the day-to-day -day work of providing health services, but also the ability to stand not just a single type of sh shock, but one that is developed with a strategic plan in place to endure whatever stocks, uh, shocks are placed upon it. Collaboration amongst all stakeholders is key from planning in the design stage for resilient systems. Just as AI by, um, by design or privacy by design is being put into place, there is a huge need to have a disaster risk management plan by design to be put in place at the core when developing e-health and m-health solutions so that the system is robust, can withstand future shocks such as the COVID-19 pandemic and other stresses and other challenges that come in the future. And so um, the Sendai framework has a lot of different um, 
um, stakeholders involved and in the case of the views of the WHO in their um, the WHO in their 2020 publication um, had a variety of uh, details which I'm going to go through here is that it had technical guidance on the Sunday Sunday framework and reporting for ministries of health and this outlines how to gather health data and process and processes and to establish standards on how to report for the Sendai framework and the UN sustainable development goals against uh, amongst other guidelines for best practices. So think of it, this framework, and particularly the WHO and their publication as a framework for comparability for monitoring, exception monitoring, notifications, prediction data, metadata, sharing of data. Each country of each organization has different standards. And so in the WHO coming um, out with this, it creates kind of a common framework and a common set of reporting. So we can compare um, plans, we can compare reports and really monitor going forward. Um, in regards to the ITU and UNESCO, other two other UN agencies, uh, Amali, do you want to discuss this, or should I go on as well? Um, you, you can you can just read that. Well. Okay, great. So in the twenty twenty one, um, uh, the ITU established the ITU focus group on AI for natural disaster management in close collaboration with um, the United Nations Environmental Program and the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO. And they uh, that complemented the already established ITU special focus group on AI and health. And it's a joint collaboration with the ITU and uh, the WHO that looks on the ethics of AI health systems. For ethical systems are typically risk managed systems. UNESCO's UN um, Educational Science Culture Organization has also published a recommendation on ethics and AI. And that's important for the Internet of Things for healthcare. And for our discussion today, um, the Sendai framework sets four specific priority points for action that we're going to discuss. Uh, number one is understand what are the potential impacts for disaster risk. That's question number one that we're going to have our discussion later. To strengthen disaster risk governance, what are the policies, regulation, collaboration, and management that are needed to manage disaster risk? How do we invest in disaster risk redu reduction for resilience? And number four, how do we enhance disaster preparedness, i.e. risk mitigation for effective response, building back better in recovery and rehabilitation and reconstruction? So those are four different questions that we're gonna have in our discussion today. And so question number one, so I'm gonna just pause here for a moment to see if uh, Amali wants to make any comments before we get into our discussion and our questions. So I'm just going to pause for a moment and I'm just going to give it over to you for a few moments. Thank you so much, Robert. So here we just had a, a, a disaster. Uh, <laughs> my screen is flickering nonstop um, and I must have had some virus suddenly come in. Uh, something has happened. Um, and so uh, we really are in, in a really a disaster situation as it were, but here Robert has recovered it for us. Uh, very graciously and thank you very much. So, so let's continue. So yeah, please everybody participate and we really appreciate hearing all your comments. Please. Great, Amali, and this is again, um, we didn't uh, purposely do this, but we built yes. in a, an example into our presentation today. And I think one of the things to understand is that it wasn't one person, it wasn't one entity, it was a variety of um, different individuals. We had a plan in place, we all had copies of the presentation, we all had our assigned roles, and we all had a sense of what to do um, when things go wrong. And as someone who works um, uh, in the past, I've worked a lot on internet governance. I continue to do so. I'm also working on public policy and have done a lot of work on digital security. And um, I have thus a, a big experience in resiliency and um, recovering from challenges, be they disasters or episodes, and so the moment we identified at the beginning of the presentation that there was a problem, um, it's not that we were struggling to find a solution. Um, we just used a script that had been used in the past. And so though it wasn't known to us, I've gone through many of these situations in the past, I knew exactly what to do. And so we needed to continue with the presentation, which we did, and we're just going forward. And so um, I'm going to ask a question 
um, taking this, um, um, putting a different hat on from one that's kind of leading the, uh, the, the presentation to one leading the question. And I'm very keen to have comments from those that are listening to us today and whether um, people um, can either type in their questions on the chat or uh, raise their hands. I'm very keen to have an intricate conversations. Um, so the question I want to pose everyone, um, both um, some of the, the panelists um, and those that are watching is, given the very um, um, challenging situation that we've had over the last more or less two years, where COVID-19 has dramatically changed um, the world, um, I'm going to ask a very humble question and try to get really sure it is, what have we learned in regards to the issues, the risks, the opportunities, et cetera, from health technology and ICT rollout during the COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, I wanna hear from those in different regions of the world. Um, so for example, um, I'll just say, for example, in my case in Canada, um, the one thing that we have learned is that though governments in the past have always said that they're constrained by budgets, that they can't implement programs right away. We have realized that both in um, rolling out responses, rolling out um, emergency assistance, money is not an option. So when governments are recognizing that a situation is grave, they can act incredibly quickly. Um, schools can implement um, remote learning and doctors can as well. Um, but that's here in Canada. Um, I can get into more details, but I'm the moderator. I'm keen to hear from if there's anyone um, outside the Americas, if you can either raise your hand um, or if um, you wanna text your question in the chat, please do so. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment uh, if anyone wants to speak. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. What I'm gonna do is I'm maybe gonna ask, uh, um, I'm just gonna call on people that are listening to us today. So I'm gonna um, go over to Frederick that I know is um, in a different region than I. I um, wanna get maybe your thoughts on what is it that um, your region has learned from um, COVID-19 pandemic and how it's affected um, health technology and ICT rollout. So Frederick, over to you. <clears throat> so hello everyone, uh, I'm Frederic, I'm talking from Paris, and I can say that uh, uh, the pandemic was a, uh, a real clean new ring for our economy because we had uh, to learn how to work uh, with uh, such difficulties, uh, to meet each other, uh, to can uh, discuss and uh, have a uh, discussion on topics that uh, uh, that concern uh, all the population. And uh, so the vaccine was uh, uh, an important method to implement for everyone. And I can say that I don't mind. And uh, now we need some uh, QR code uh, to, to present each other uh, in the some of the public spaces. Um, so many people have the to change uh, their habits uh, and uh, the use of different uh, elements of uh, their uh, daily life. And uh, it's important, I think, uh, that we can continue to discuss uh, to implement better uh, methods uh, to develop uh, our uh, continuing work together. Great, thank you so much, Frederick. Um, Alex, I see your hand up, so you just... Uh... Just tell us uh, your name, uh, organization, and where you are, and please, um, look, we're looking forward to your comments. Go ahead. Thank you, Robert. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Buckham. Um, I live in the UK, and I spent a lot of this year working for uh, an NGO, a London-based NGO called the European Centre for Democracy and Human Rights, um, that focuses on human rights issues in the Gulf, primarily uh, focusing on uh, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. Um, I do also, though, which is the reason why I'm here today, I also uh, have a, um, a long time uh, passion, interest and uh, speci I specialise in issues of mass surveillance, human rights and, and everything in between in, in, in those uh, sectors. 
So um, I've written a few things down. So please, Robert, if I stray over, just give me a shout and I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop. But it's in relation to specifically risks, um, Milton Friedman, arguably the most like, well-known advocate of free market economics, um, said about crises that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That's the quote. And we live in a world in which Adam Smith's uh, vile maxim of all for ourselves and nothing for other people kind of reigns supreme. And many of the dominant ideas that were lying around prior to the coronavirus crisis were those that previously yielded gross concentrations of wealth and power. Um, so very briefly regarding wealth concentration throughout the pandemic, workers worldwide lost an approximated $3.7 trillion and billionaires gained $3.9 trillion the single biggest one year wealth transfer um, in all of history. That speaks for itself, obviously. But in the topic of power concentration, in the same way that terrorist attacks are crises that are frequently used to usher in um, pervasive human rights violating surveillance programs, a quick read through recent reports and articles on the subject draws our attention to how the pandemic's been used to enhance the extent of various forms of surveillance and data collection. Um, that raises the issue of these measures in spite of promises that they're only temporary and will be um, rolled back when the virus is under control. So in April 2020, um, the OECD warned that the risks that such COVID-related ICTs as contact tracing apps, facial recognition systems, etc., will pose. So they warned about these uh, risks um, to people's privacy. Other ICTs such as biometrics, AI, uh, big data analysis and so forth, um, under the guise of combating the virus can be very effectively used to keep track of all movement, communication activity of people and so forth. Um, it's been widely argued that whilst these measures may very well uh, help combat COVID-19, um, the long-term problems these measures will pose to civil liberties will not be insignificant if not uh, kept in check by civil society. Um, so, you know, in Hong Kong, bracelets were given to people um, in compulsory quarantine, which share their data with government via social media platforms. The Polish app for home quarantine quarantining requires home phone numbers, reference photos and regular check ins. Then on a larger scale in the US, the two point two trillion dollar aid package in the 2020 uh, COVID relief bill um, saw federal lobbying filing skyrocket and the federal government awarding more than thirty six billion dollars to private contractors. Um, this yielded massive transfers of people's personal data from public to private stakeholders was done largely without the public's uh, knowledge and raises serious questions um, about really what this data will be used for and how this may open new avenues for data to be exploited in the future. Um, then to finally to my uh, home country in the UK, um, COVID allowed the UK government to pass critical procurement law, um, which obviously relates to those who, it regards those who get to bid for government deals, basically. And this led to individuals and companies who donated large sums to the Conservative Party, uh, profiting massively from NHS contracts. During the pandemic, we've also seen the UK publishing a national data strategy in which it was stated that the government sought for the extent to which data has been shared during the pandemic to become the new normal in the UK. And this pattern repeats itself um, wherever you look. The World Justice Project has made the case that these tech-based means of combating COVID-19 um, that have been employed everywhere from the UK to China, involving practices varying from drone surveillance, facial recognition, contact tracing and quarantine enforcement apps, could become the norm uh, post-COVID-19. Um, so yeah. apologies. Alex, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll pause and I'll try to um, yeah. Yeah, I want to hear from some other regions as well, and maybe we can get a conversation between the regions. But, you know, one of the things I'm hearing from you and just from one of the things I mentioned earlier is that one of the, um, I wouldn't say call it disasters, but one of the contingencies that perhaps um, civil society and, and different organizations didn't plan for is for governments to react very quickly to a crisis. And we saw that during the terrorist attacks 9-11 in Washington, D.C., where there was a flurry of um, policies that had been parked for a long period of time in regards to civil liberties just get implemented um, with only one vote against it. Um, 
and a massive change in terms of how government gets done things and enormous amount of money spent. And it, it's going to take years or decades just to track all that that's happened. And in the case of COVID-19, I know in the case here in Canada, but also following what's happening in the US, and I'm going to echo your point as well, it was that all done so quickly the things should be done quickly when there's a crisis, but then so much gets put in that's got unrelated to it that there isn't necessarily oversight and it changes really uh, and, and it can entrench um, um, just fundamental changes to government, but also it opens one up to corruption as well. And so, um, you know, on some of the issues for privacy and stuff like that, I have two people that have raised their hands. And so maybe we can have a, a conversation to see if they've seen that as well is I have, um, pardon if I don't pronounce the name properly, is we have Enoch from Ghana, and then we have Christine from Asia. So um, Ghana, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Can you hear me, please? Loud and clear, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So in Ghana, like most developing countries, we really didn't have the, 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 the backbone infrastructure to give mass access to digital resources, especially the internet. So when the pandemic struck, uh, we realized that the internet was almost a necessity like water. And here was the case that we didn't have the, 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 the backbone or the core infrastructure to give people this access to the internet, which was now a necessity, not only for health issues, but for education, for work, and all of that. So I think Ghana, particularly, or Africa, if I'm not wrong, the, the, the infrastructure, the, the core infrastructure to give mass access, to give everybody access to the internet and to other digital resources, irrespective of their location, was really what we learned. And we, 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 saw, we saw that it is not a, I mean, a luxury anymore to give access to the internet to everybody. It is a necessity. And post-pandemic era, it will still be a necessity. So I think we have started learning, we have learned some lessons and going forward, I can see that there are initiatives to expand the internet access in Ghana and to uh, give uh, digital resources to people in rural areas. They are giving laptops to almost every teacher at a subsidized price and a lot of initiatives to bring everybody on board the digital uh, uh, era. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and now over to Christine, um, keen to hear from you, but also there's a certain things that um, Alex mentioned about Asia. And so if you could fit those into your comment, that would be great as well. Thank you, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Christine. Uh, I'm actually a Singaporean, but working in China. Uh, so for me, during the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, it was an interesting experience for me, uh, in part because uh, I was living in China, but also uh, I have a family uh, back in Singapore. Um, so uh, back to my comment about uh, what we learned uh, during the pandemic regarding ICT rollout and uh, uh, everybody's uh, response time. Um, I think one of the things that was quite empowering for us uh, was that uh, I think individuals, uh, especially also uh, communities uh, that are like, uh, you know, scientists and uh, technical professionals or medical experts, uh, we can coordinate efforts at the grassroots level uh, to support the government efforts. So government efforts sometimes may be quite slow uh, but for example, uh, uh, the China Association of uh, Science and Technology, uh, for which I'm uh, one of the volunteer for, uh, we quickly uh, organized uh, during, uh, I think it was February uh, last year, we very quickly organized, uh, you know, rallied our uh, technical community uh, to provide uh, translations uh, of the WHO documents and uh, news updates, uh, as well as uh, statistics on COVID-19 as they were released. So I remember during the lockdown, uh, I was at home, but I was actually very busy uh, translating a lot of uh, these uh, documents and uh, posting them uh, on an ad hoc uh, grassroots website. 
Uh, and then as for uh, Singapore, um, I think uh, most people, uh, especially individuals, uh, were very proactive. Um, the government, uh, especially the Ministry of Health, also released uh, this of official um, website or official uh, WhatsApp, uh, this um, uh, information portals, so that everyone knew for sure that this is the authoritative uh, channel to look for information and news. So um, whenever somebody had, um, you know, maybe some close contact, uh, you know, I was quite happy to, to read news and also learn from some friends also back in Singapore uh, that they would actually proactively call up the authorities and say, hey, do I need to be quarantined? Uh, do I need to be checked uh, for, you know, to do a DNA test? And uh, also uh, because in uh, Asia, the, especially in China, there are also uh, these uh, online tools uh, like live streaming. So uh, we actually saw many videos uh, coming up uh, for information related to, uh, you know, te uh, technical information related to COVID-19 uh, to uh, debug fake news and also uh, sort of um, prevent uh, misinformation. So everybody kind of knew that there would be one or two persons or one or two agencies that were authoritative sources of information. And then, you know, people would get the, try to get the information uh, from these sources. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, just some of my sharing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna maybe, um comment, as I mentioned earlier, kind of from my perspective, both in North America, but also um, in Canada, um, you know, what is it that we've learned? What are some of the issues, gaps, opportunities in regards to health technology and ICTs during the COVID-19 pandemic? There's kind of three things that come to mind. Um, one thing that I think that um, uh, Christine just mentioned now is the importance of having communication plans, especially if you're governments especially if your governments that believe in, in science is to have ways that authoritative um, science-based information can be made available and having concrete and easy to understand um, videos and engagements. For example, in the case of Canada, um, there were videos of our prime minister converted to Lego for kids uh, so kids could understand it. And our public health officials who perhaps were unknown to many of us before, to this day are on TV almost every single day. And so for communications to have, um, and for governments to have communications plan in place and communications and media training, in my view, is key. That these government officials need to have plans so they can react quickly. Another thing, an opportunity is collaboration, particularly around comparing statistics from different countries, um, it was uh, very quick that countries in, in Europe and Africa and elsewhere, at first all the portals such as the University of Washington, um, Oxford University and others had statistic sites within weeks of COVID-19 coming so we could compare things. And the other thing too is in regards to, I would say, opportunities of those in the health sector that perhaps were underfunded and not known that are now, I would say, the stars of the day are epidemiologists. Um, and infectious disease experts who, again, have been doing a lot of work, particularly around other infectious diseases such as SARS, such as Ebola, malaria, that really weren't known to the public and now are the media stars of the day. And also in regards to technologies is the ever important um, collaboration around, uh, particularly globally, around technologies that allow for sequencing of infectious agents so one can very quickly um, um, develop treatments and vaccines. It was the team from China that published the um, genetic analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And within a month or two, vaccines were already starting to be in phase one trials. This normally would have taken 10 years, but because of a global collaboration and the technology that worked uh, allowed for this to happen, and I would say too is a 
golden opportunity is that we're probably entering the era of mRNA treatments and vaccines, and um, that will be something as an opportunity. But one of the things that Alex mentioned earlier is in moving quickly on all these different aspects, let's not forget that while we're, where governments around the world have tried to react, some slower, some faster, others sometimes have other agendas. And instead of solving just the public health crisis or the disaster or the emergency, they start embedding other changes that fundamentally change the nature of, of government, the nature of accountability, and the nature of democratic oversight. And it's up to all of us to understand that things can move quickly and there should be mechanisms, mechanisms and procedures built into international organizations and response systems so um, one does not have these fundamental negative changes that occur as well too. Recognizing the time, I'm now going to move to question number two, um, and I'm going to uh, put it over to Frederick. So Frederick, if you can read the question and have any introductory comments, I'll pass it over to you. Go ahead. So Frederick, the mic is yours. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, he may have to share screen. Uh, so, uh, our question is how, sorry, just as you get set up, Frederick, uh, Amali, can you just tell Frederick how much time he has and um, so he can um, adjust his um, uh, time Frederick, accordingly? you have about 20, 20 minutes. Okay. So our question is, how can we develop resilient, timely, relevant health technologies for the future to enable management in times of crisis? And how can the UNIGF and UN agencies community help with this? The situation now for international co cooperation is we have is that we have to remain that uh, this agreement uh, in Sendai uh, was achieved during a period of development for cyber security in uh, uh, during uh, the pre-pandemic period. Uh, the purpose was also to create a legal framework for volunteering as it exists for wildfire. And it includes a periodic review of member states and partners. Like we said, um, uh, there are uh, different uh, leaders were talking together to implement a new structure to develop uh, security and uh, cooperation around the world uh, in regard to the authority of the Security Council of the UN. So uh, it includes, of course, NGOs. And, uh, and all the partners would, uh, would review their cooperation uh, uh, each period. Now, there are different spaces of interaction. It includes space, air, marine, ground, and cyber. All the rescue teams now include robots and AI. It means uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, wearable devices, and uh, of course, autonomous systems that, uh, that have to be uh, relayed by the an in, a special uh, algorithms and a different way of talking uh, to develop performance and velocity uh, in case of emergencies. It also includes, uh, for periodic reviews, uh, to maintain a state of uh, security that uh, uh, concerns all the fields of the society and civil society and military fields. In another way, to improve global collectivity, it's important to conceive uh, smart cities regulated with sufficient energy. It means that uh, there are different sources of energy uh, that are provided in our cities. Uh, in uh, water pipe works and also road trafficking that have to be uh, closer together uh, to, work, to work in synergy. Uh, so 
So, so we need to improve our, the footprint uh, with low carbon emissions. And it means that uh, our talking for the future uh, would, would uh, benefit a better transport uh, to include uh, uh, all, these, all, all people in the society, including the ones with disabilities, and also uh, uh, perform a better development uh, to, uh, to continue our work to progress in the future. In, so in regard to this, how to build back better, to build back better, there are two important meanings. The first is to secure investment for manufacturing and also to increase communication around the world for partnership. There is an important uh, ILO campaign to uh, use uh, teleworking uh, with, uh, within social networks um, to develop, uh, to develop uh, our methods and knowledge um, uh, to build back better. So it means uh, that uh, uh, the future of uh, our work would be uh, uh, using the internet and, um, and the World Bank could support uh, this, uh, uh, this development. Also, uh, we remain that uh, on, on Waipo's Day, uh, there would be celebration uh, and uh, also with many other side events. So now, how our partnerships and also member states and NGOs could develop uh, this solution is our question. And I hope that uh, we could respond to it earlier. Uh, now, Frederick, uh, you can perhaps take some questions from uh, or comments from the audience. Yes, who would like to respond? So here we're, we're, we're asking you for your feedback, please, um, Somali, is how do you think, um, you know, when you look at the United Nations, how do you think that the various agencies, where, say, for instance, uh, UNICEF or the United Nations Development Program, how could we work with them from the internet perspective to um, support your local community better into the future and especially in times of crisis. So this is what we're trying to look at. Uh, it's, it's been um, a big topic of discussion at uh, the International Telecommunications Union during their WSIS forum, which is an annual event that brings together thousands of people together. And um, so it's, it's about talking about things like, you know, are there uh, landlocked states or are there small islands um, that can be supported for larger countries uh, close by? Um, for instance, can they provide some support? Maybe uh, countries that have satellites can, can support some smaller nations. Uh, maybe there's a way of, um, of uh, under the sea cables uh, that can be connected. Uh, from larger countries to smaller countries nearby. So it, it's, it's bringing together all the UN agencies. And we were just wondering um, if you have ideas that you'd like to share, um, how this could be made better. So that's, that's the question that we're talking about here. Great, that's and just to Molly, great. just we have 10 minutes or so, and so keen that yeah. we get feedback and comments from everyone. And so please, everyone is before. I see that we have, um, someone's got their hand up. Um, so please, um, you have your hand up, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is Siva Subramaniam. I'm from India. And uh, uh, one of the points mentioned just now about uh, undersea cables, uh, when it comes to a continent like, like Africa, which has a huge landmass, submarine cables terminating at the seashore does not help. Uh, what is important is uh, inland connectivity, uh, inland uh, tier one connectivity. Um, is uh, Africa in 
some way working with uh, uh, various uh, uh, internet uh, organizations and uh, probably even with uh, uh, UN agencies to um, bring uh, the submarine cables um, subterrain, subterrain or um, overland, inland. So it's uh, actually a misnomer. So we are talking about submarine cables and technically marine cables terminate at uh, where the sea ends. But uh, is there some way by which uh, uh, Africa and uh, other uh, landlocked uh, zones could uh, bring in uh, uh, the submarine cables inland to terminate inland at various points so that uh, the connectivity quality is uh, improved? Thank you. So Thank you. let me just go for, um, see if we have another question, but also remembering that the specific question is how can we develop resilient, timely, relevant health technologies for, your future, for the future and enable management in times of crisis? And so definitely um, what you've just mentioned now is having, um, you know, fiber um, optic cables terminate just offshore of a country. Um, and not have, um, just before a crisis hits, does not allow for resilient, timely health technologies that are interconnected to work. And so definitely um, UN um, agencies under the Sendai framework and elsewhere really need to develop plans to have all these connectivities in place as well. Um, but also I think I'm, I'm keen to hear from others on how we can develop resilient, relevant health technologies for the future. So do we have any other comments and then we'll get back to discussion on your point as well about um, off, off sea um, or off land cables as well too. So let me look at the participants. Um, we have uh, Amado Espinosa, go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Nice meeting you. I am in a MAC member for, from the IPF uh, from Mexico representing the private sector Latin Americas. I am a physician myself with a uh, PhD in the field of medical informatics in Germany. Um, I, I think there is a great opportunity to, to look forward, uh, well, to develop, of course, different health te technologies, but uh, especially talking about IC patients uh, during this kind of crisis in this framework of the uh, Sendai Agreement. I think it is very important to talk about, uh, about interoperability and how can we share international standards in order to make it possible to, to share uh, not only the application, but also the data, which uh, clinical data, which is really relevant in terms of the global health uh, concept in the of different trends that are, are already in place. The, the collaboration, as you already mentioned, Robert, from ITU and WHO regarding the use or ethical use of the, the uh, artificial intelligence in, in the healthcare area, it's, it's very interesting. They are trying to cover the area of uh, standards for uh, developing applications for encoding information and for um, encoding processes, which will enable our countries to, to grow in terms of the, their capabilities to apply this technology and also to be able to develop new applications, which probably should be shared from these kind of groups with other countries in order for us to be able to, to have something uh, reasonable, affordable for different economies. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Amado, as well. And um, I think something that comes to mind as well is uh, another uh, agency that uh, has not been mentioned as well, but that's related as we hopefully um, slowly move out of um, some of the issues and we can travel a bit more is also the role of IATA in regards to coordinated international uh, travel standards and vaccination moving from the WHO yellow 
um, vaccine passports to something that is um, both electronic, but also um, will work across different jurisdictions. Um, I think definitely in regards to uh, WHO's role is, is really key because it's a health crisis, but the next crisis could be something different um, as well. Um, and I think it's, it's very key that the different UN agencies that have different mandates and remits uh, be able to work together. And we know that's not always um, an easy thing to do, um, but I think it's an important thing to do so we can move forward. Um, I think, do we have any other questions or, or comments up? Um, just uh, gonna wait here, see if anyone in the chat. We do have um, Alex, um, you have another comment. Please go ahead and you have uh, four minutes, go ahead. I'll just keep this very brief. Um, and I think other people uh, um, in this discussion today will be far better qualified than me to speak about this. But it strikes me that based on um, how the the world and the west in particular has handled uh the the coronavirus i think that in preparation for the next crisis um whatever that may be i think there's a real need to um ensure that the developing world is not left behind um uh it i think that that ultimately has to be one of the, the founding principles of any kind of, um, uh, for lack of a better word, like collective immunity in the future. If you apply that on a global scale, um, what's the good in, in, in you know, uh, achieving herd immunity in you know, the UK, for example, if like innumerable countries in Africa, India, et cetera, et cetera, um, are, are, are struggling? Um, and I think that so incorporating some mechanism whereby developing countries are not left behind um, uh, would be, I think, be a, a step forward. Great. Um, thank you so much. I'm just trying to see if there's any other comments, just so just looking at time as well. And so I'm going to go over here to question number three. Uh, Herman Ramos, uh, you're up next. Let me know if you want me to read the question or whether you want to do that. Go ahead, Herman, over to you. Herman will share some slides, I believe, from his side. Yeah, hello, thank you. Uh, yeah, Herman, feel free to share the slides. Okay, thank you. Um, Can you see the slides? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I will just make a small introduction, then I will come back to the question. Uh, as mentioned in the SEDAI framework, uh, public and private investments on infrastructure play an important role uh, and also provide benefits at economic and social and cultural level. Uh, Digital technologies are becoming more important in almost uh, all aspects of our daily lives, including healthcare. And uh, when we analyze the existing infrastructure, uh, we, we can see that many of them are not in pace with the new or evolved technologies. And this can become a problem because uh, these organizations uh, can lose value proposition. And when we talk about value proposition, we are talking about lose of revenue, uh, lose of opportunities, and the also lose of uh, competitivity in the market because they are not providing the uh, service that's uh, modernized. Uh, and when we analyze the investments in technology infrastructure, uh, when we see that it's important to develop uh, technology or oh, a, a strategic plan uh, around technology or uh, uh, infrastructure because uh, we uh, we can see that there are many challenges, uh, especially when we are talking about investments in infrastructure because we have to understand in which part of the infrastructure we have to provide investment or we have to work with 
because it is not possible to work to the to provide investments in in whole uh, health system. So we have to divide or decide in which part we are providing the investments. Also, we have to decide in which sector, because if we are going to provide investments, we will have some sectors that will not be work or will not be providing service. So we have to we have to analyze which kinds of loss lost we lose we will have will have in these kinds of sectors. And also going to the present diagram, we can see that uh, when we work with uh, current system and when we provide investments, we see that uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, upgrade of infrastructure that will, will have to analyze the performance and the, the implementation of the system and analyze if the digital technologies are improving the system uh, as a whole. And if they are providing uh, these benefits, if, if they are uh, providing, they are improving the system, Basically, they provide benefits, and these benefits can be growth of, of the organization, can be the job creation, and also uh, increase of or, or increase of the value proposition. And these uh, these benefits help maximize the digital health uh, outcomes. And this is only possible when we have a strategic plan. But also there are stakeholders that play a crucial role in order to uh, provide these investments. And these stakeholders can be uh, different kinds. For example, when we talk about the health system, we have different stakeholders, such as public, they can be the community patient, health workers, or sometimes uh, health managers, investors, government planners. But when we are, including uh, we are providing or integrating uh, digital technology in the health system. We are basically uh, making an integration of internet governance and health system. That's why we have to decide or we have to work uh, and see which stakeholders we will identify after this integration and also uh, define their roles in order to uh, collaborate together because uh, development is only possible with uh, when different kinds of people, different kinds of uh, organization work together. So after this introduction, uh, I will go back to the question that is, what investments are required to build back better, stronger health and technology infrastructure for the future, uh, taking into account the Sendai framework and also taking into account the, uh, the COVID pandemic, and also who are the stakeholders with this integration with, between health system and internet governance and how should collaboration be conducted? Thank you. So I will be waiting for the contribution. Great, so let's open up, I'm gonna open up the floor. I'm checking here to see the chat. If anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, please do. Um, if not, um, I'll ask the moderator of this session to ask someone. Oop, we have a comment um, from Siva. If you wanna make uh, that comment uh, by audio, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, one of the reasons why healthcare uh, remains unaffordable and uh, uh, expensive is uh, that uh, there is a, uh, um, theory that uh, all medicine has to be evidence-based and uh, um, there is a, a predominantly Western uh, ecosystem for healthcare, which uh, recognizes only uh, allopathic medicine and uh, uh, endorses only that which is supported by formalized research that uh, that has its own holes and gaps and uh, completely disregards uh, traditional and alternate branches of medicine, which are time tested, but not uh, scientifically uh, established in the present uh, stream of uh, approvals. 
so one thing that uh, a continent like africa and uh, countries uh, around the world could do is to uh, collaborate among stakeholders to reintegrate uh, uh, traditional and alternate branches of medicine effectively tackling barriers such as uh, uh, the insistence on evidence based medicine so once uh, the traditional and alternate branches of medicine and traditional and alternate branches of health systems are uh, integrated then healthcare becomes far more affordable thank you I, this is Amali Prabhat, just a moment. I, I agree with you. I know in Sri Lanka, for instance, for COVID-19, they invented something called a pani, uh, which is a syrup. And um, they were using that quite a bit, uh, this alternative medicine. Um, and I think there is a huge area, I agree with you, um, to, to develop uh, using technologies uh, and so forth. And, and maybe I'm, I'm not a doctor, but comparing the modern medicine traditional medicines. We, heard, we have heard many times as well that uh, some of the traditional medicines have been the, the seed uh, or the idea for some of the modern medicines uh, that we have. And now we have this capability with, uh, with collaboration and artificial intelligence and what Robert was talking about as well in, in the development of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals going forward. So thank you. I really appreciate that comment, actually. Thank you. Uh, if I may react, uh, would you allow me to react to that? Certainly, Please go certainly. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent uh, example. Uh, so uh, one of the barriers is that uh, if you have uh, alternate uh, medicine, let's say for COVID in Sri Lanka or in India or in Africa and in the form of a syrup or, a, uh, or some other uh, 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 herbal uh, concoction, which is uh, in reality far more effective. Is it conceivable that uh, someone could uh, uh, go to an airport and say, I have taken uh, this alternate medicine, so I'm free from COVID. Um, the barrier comes into play in the form of an insistence by way of an established system that recognizes only uh, a certain uh, vaccine developed in, by a certain pro process and approved by a certain process, which is blocked, effectively blocked for alternate and traditional medicine. So with, this is what uh, keeps uh, healthcare uh, unreachable and affordable for uh, uh, over half of the world's population and something needs to be done. So collaboration could help, investments could help, social enterprise could help, and government agencies could help. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great comment. And I think something that, um, you know, in talking in terms of uh, the previous questions as well is, you know, it's both for the discussion in this forum, but also bringing it up to, you know, the WHO, but also IATA in regards to, to travel and coordination. I think something that we have seen COVID-19 in a way, not only challenge the it's almost like a stress test on our system, um, but also um, perhaps um, introducing, as we've mentioned in this discussion, the gaps that currently exist. Um, I think one of the challenges and issues that it comes up in regards to misinformation and things like that. And so one of the challenges in regards to COVID-19 is efficacy of different types of treatments. Um, we have seen, um, uh, both some types of vaccines um, who uh, like the AstraZeneca vaccine that um, has been used in many parts of the world or most parts of the world um, get a negative wrap in some parts and um, the mRNA vaccines um, being highlighted and um, other, um, other type of treatments being promoted but actually not helping anyone at ounce too. And so making sure that there can be a science-driven um, mechanism by which different types of treatments and methods can be evaluated um, quickly um, and um, um, then be incorporated into, for example, travel documents and, and other sorts is particularly uh, important. And those are particular investments that are needed 
I would say two is the emergence and role of genetic sequencing, particularly for the variants and for other aspects or skills and technologies that may not be as available to other parts of the world. And I would say is that not only do we need internet and ICT infrastructure, um, but also modern genetic um, sequencing and other technologies available to different parts of the world. It's no use having an internet connected country if you don't have access to the latest technologies to be able to sequence and to collaborate as well. Um, so I think that's that's particular key as well. Um, it, I see that we have for this particular segment another two minutes. So I'm gonna go back to our moderator if there's any wrap up comments that he would like to make and then I'll move over to question number four. So over to our moderator for two minutes and then I'll go over to the next question. Thank you. Uh, Basically, uh, all talk, uh, all mention uh, very good points. And I will just, because you all mentioned the most important points, I will just make a comment in relation to the to the investment that, uh, especially in the health system, is being doing in relation to the artificial intelligence, uh, IoT, machine, lear machine learning. And when we analyze the Basically, there's a lot of investment been doing in this field, but when we analyze the investment been doing in this field, we analyze that maybe there is there is a concentration of investments in some parts of the of the of the world, uh, and and in other parts are being left behind. For example, and uh, in this affects the 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 the, the, the and uh, also in relation to the to the product itself, because one of them is developing a product and is implementing the product according to their standards. But uh, others that are not, don't have the, the necessary uh, financial resource to buy, uh, to invest in this field, are be left behind. And the years later, they will buy the same equipment, but the equipment was not developed according to their needs or to, the condition or today uh, uh, geographical taking into consideration their geographic location and they need so this this disparity but it's not only happening in, the, in relation to the latest uh, technology solution but it's all also happening in relation to the other other topics related to, to internet governance so, <coughs> it's, so so it's important to to have this uh, uh, I don't know how we can uh, make this happen, but it's important also to, uh, as you, you were saying, the accessibility to provide also low cost equipment in order to implement in other countries. And also work, and, and also, and also work, work with uh, regulatory framework and standards because it's important to include uh, other location, rural areas, uh, marginalized communities, and this kinds of discussion to build uh, to build these these kinds of equipment and uh, also uh, basically technology solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so very much for that. And now we're going to be moving over to our uh, fourth and final question. Um, uh, Jorn, over to you. Jorn will screen share as well, please, Robert. Okay, um, so I, uh, I have to say uh, my background is uh, computer science and law. I'm not a health specialist, but we, we did uh, quite some um, um, webinars uh, and invited health specialists uh, with Geneva Macrolabs uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. And I found it quite interesting um, to, to see that uh, there are of course, different opinions about what uh, helps against COVID-19. So we, we have uh, different schools, different schools of sorts, and uh, why you might agree or disagree uh, what, uh, of course, what, uh, what the validity and uh, the best approach is. I think it is very important to keep discussion 
about the, the right approach. So uh, we, we should not um, start to talk about uh, disinformation too early when it's just uh, some other opinion. And uh, particularly with COVID-19, we've seen that quite some big and famous institutions have been wrong in the beginning and had to adjust their opinion. And um, in this time of uncertainty, of course, some people might say we, we need more um, <clears throat> uh, clarity and we should uh, not spread any information that we think is not uh, not true, but at the same time, the discussion during that time is, is very important. So I, I would. Uh, <coughs> it is it is quite important to um, <clears throat> to uh, to keep an open discussion, and of course, uh, um, this is it's not always uh, easy. But um, well, uh, coming to the uh, topic, uh, to, to long-term future vision for healthcare uh, technology, uh, we, we basically see uh, some kind of a, a circle. Um, we see evolving risk. We see evolving risk from technology. We see evolving risk from the outside, like COVID-19. Um, but uh, we will see new risk um, uh, arriving uh, all the time and um, uh, COVID-19 was not the first pandemic, but it was the first pandemic of this um, this size or magnitude for, for a long time. We had the Spanish flu, which was quite severe as well, but it was uh, like a hundred years ago. So uh, when we see a verbal risk, <clears throat> we see that uh, governance um, shall improve and sh shall counter those risks. Um, also, governance has to take into account uh, external uh, constraints that uh, um, are raised that um, we, we should um, take into account. And then we, we have a mitigation uh, and uh, uh, strategy that will enhance resilience. And this includes, of course, again, new technology. So we have technology uh, 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 that um, evolves, we use new technology, and this will again create new risks. So for example, if we use AI techniques at some uh, stage, we will have a specific uh, risk associated with them. And these, those need to be mitigated against as well. So when we look uh, at the uh, long-term perspective, I think resilience is key. And uh, you might imagine there, there are many, many potential risks. So there is, for example, um, <clears throat> loss of power. So if, if uh, more devices with energy, the loss of power uh, is, is more, <coughs> has more consequences. So it becomes more important that uh, uh, power is uh, still there. We have um, the problem is that we increasingly rely on connectivity because we use remote services from the cloud to um, cloud storage to remote diagnosis, uh, whatever. So this is, uh, um, we are increasingly uh, becoming uh, dependent on connectivity. Um, and we might also have uh, a data loss, uh, which is uh, very severe uh, when, when um, there is no, there are no paper records anymore for the treatment of patients and, um, you suddenly you don't know how to treat patients anymore because uh, you lost uh, access to their records. We have software bugs. Software bugs can be quite uh, problematic uh, if um, you use the same software um, at, at all the places. We have computer viruses. We have increasingly ransomware. So this, this ransomware risk has become a bigger risk because we use technology. And uh, we also have the risk of attacks by foreign government, which of course are uh, illegal by uh, international co uh, convention, but we, uh, we do have uh, attacks on um, hospitals, although they are legal too. So uh, we, we must, um, we must uh, try to um, mitigate those, those risks as well. So we have a lot of risks and the number of digital risks is rising. So we, uh, 
<clears throat> At the same time, um, situations like COVID-19 show us that uh, we can use um, technology in a, in a way to mitigate um, um, some, some of the risks uh, connected to the virus. So we can uh, exchange information and, and concerning new research. I think it's uh, um, it really got a lot quicker uh, when you take a look at um, um, worldwide research on COVID-19. This was quite fast. So this is really uh, an improvement compared to uh, situations uh, some years ago where uh, the exchange was much slower. And <clears throat> We, we, uh, we uh, see that uh, um, health treatment uh, is uh, increasingly going uh, mobile, so we, we uh, can use devices mobile, we can uh, do remote diagnosis, um, um, so these, uh, these are improving. Um, we need scalable technology, so in case there is some, um, some kind of, um, <clears throat> some, some kind of um, um, yeah, pandemic or whatever, uh, you need to be able to treat a lot of uh, patients and uh, technology should not be the uh, bottleneck. Of course, you have uh, bottlenecks regarding uh, the personal uh, um, that is available, but technology should not be the bottleneck. Um, it, of course, it needs to be affordable. Um, uh, medicine that is uh, not uh, reaching uh, everybody is, is um, because of uh, it's, it's not uh, being affordable is not uh, inclusive and we also should um, <clears throat> educate people so they can self-medicate uh, that they have more literacy about um, um, uh, medical backgrounds and that they, uh, they could use uh, devices uh, in a, a way to, to self-medicate when this is of course appropriate so these are some some thoughts about um what well, what the future will bring you, you will have more intelligent devices those intelligent devices will be able to help uh, to uh, provide a better medicine but at the same uh, same time um it is it is very important um that we also uh, counter those risks that come with this new technology. So new technology has new risks and we have to uh, uh, care about the new risks so we can really benefit from the new technology. So this, these are just my thoughts back to the question. I'm, I'm happy to um, discuss any, any um, questions, thoughts, comments, uh, opinions on, on this. Um, and uh, well, thank you. Is there is there any any sort I, I see in the chat? Let me see. In the chat, uh, there is um, um, uh, Herman. Uh, Herman, do you want to comment? We can't hear you yet. Oh, sorry. That comment was for 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 the old topic. Okay. Um, this is Amali Yon. Um, I, there's no way I can put a hands up or anything. So, uh, just want to uh, talk about um, all this. Uh, not, I'm not even a technical expert, but I just want to uh, dwell upon uh, the the the. How can you say the the ease with which the new technologies and development will be able to be used uh, by people? And I'm thinking especially uh, like elderly population, uh, those with uh, poor, poor sight or hearing. Um, I'm understanding that new technologies um, will are, are going to be very supportive um, for the future. And my only concern is that we become very dependent on these technologies and we may even have robot nurses and, and so forth. Um, but what if we have something like a power outage um, or what if uh, someone buys something and it's not compatible? And the other thing is also about labeling. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned about that, that uh, there will be different standards of um, 
uh, wearable technologies or, or, or something that would come out. Um, and the patient who may buy it off the shelf uh, may not know how uh, good this product is. Um, and uh, so I have an area that I have concern for that we must have a good labeling, technology labeling, um, as well as the, the health and safety standard labeling. So I just want to make a comment there. Thank you. Um, and uh, people who may have joined uh, us later, um, I'm sorry, I lost my ability to, to share screen and my computer is flickering. So I'm just sort of butting in here. So please excuse me. Thank you. So um, um, thank you, Amali, uh, and, and you're completely right. Um, we will have more supportive technology and we will be more dependent on that technology. And uh, this uh, can be a problem in case of disaster, um, from ransomware to power outage to, to what, whatever. And we, we need to um, build technology that's resilient or use it in a way that's resilient. But I don't want to talk too much. I get, see a hand with the letter. I don't see the name of the letter. Uh, can you please, can you um, uh, ask your question? Yeah, uh, it's Siva Subramanian from India. Um, for on, 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 in the context of long-term future vision of uh, regular healthcare, especially regular healthcare and emergency healthcare, someone mentioned the insurance and uh, uh, insurance is another uh, uh, another ill of the healthcare system, which was supposed to bring down uh, the cost of healthcare to the common man and supposed to make it affordable for everyone. But it turned out to be a system which actually pushed up healthcare costs several fold. It's not like um, there is a 10% increase in healthcare cost or something. It's like uh, uh, three times uh, what it should be or five times what it should be. And uh, it actually uh, ends up uh, making healthcare uh, unaffordable. So one of the long-term things that uh, the world and uh, um, the various agencies should do is to take a serious look at how insurance works and uh, whether uh, there is an alternate way of uh, uh, doing away with uh, insurance, maybe by way of uh, um, re-engineering social security and uh, healthcare uh, support from government, and uh, which will turn out to be socially far less expensive than the present system whereby uh, everything is delegated to private insurance companies. And there are some good, good insurance companies, but uh, Many uh, work in a manner uh, uh, of creating a pattern which uh, uh, multiplies healthcare costs and make healthcare affordable, unaffordable. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you uh, you have a, a very valid point uh, uh, regarding uh, health insurance in different countries. It's organized in different ways. But I, I don't know of a country where it's completely unproblematic. So um, they, they struggle with different um, uh, issues, but the rising health care costs are uh, a real issue in, 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 in I guess, most countries. Uh, so I, I don't know any country where this is not an issue. So we, um, we need to see how can technology uh, make uh, health care more affordable. Um, what can be done, um, and we have to analyze um, um, well where the where the money actually goes, um, and um, of course um, developing healthcare, um, developing medication um, costs a lot of money, but it's also uh, of course um, a private investment uh, which is optimized to to um, um, making the most money. So um, when you, look, for example, look at research, um, you see that um, a lot of research is publicly funded and maybe um, this could be a way to, to, um, to provide uh, some, some solution there that uh, you attach some strings to the public funding. But um, I, I don't want to uh, uh, talk too much about it, especially since I see that 
uh, we have some comments. Um, how, how can um, I think Robert was first? Um, Sure, I'll just go very quick because I see that there's another uh, hand up as well. I think too is in regards to the question, something to think about, I guess, from a perspective that I've seen um, both in um, my case in Canada, but also in developing in other countries as well too, is the making sure that issues of equity and accessibility for people with disabilities and um, um, particularly seniors and elders that they need to be incorporated into emergency response plans as well too. Sometimes they, we've seen with COVID-19 that um, particularly seniors living in long-term care were affected very quickly and the emergency response plans were not adequate to deal with that and to develop ways to um, support them and uh, prioritize them as well, leading to a much higher death rate than would have been the case had equitable plans been developed. So I just wanted to raise that and I'll, I'll leave it to the next person to comment as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chiara? Chiara, sorry, sorry, I misspelled your name. Yeah, my name is Chiara, exactly. I'm from Italy. I'm not an expert because I, I teach at the University of International Accounting, so it is something different. But I think that um, in the future vision for uh, health technology, what is important, what is crucial to me is the information because uh, um, they, um, so uh, a technology must be based and also generating and using information that is uh, transparent, relevant, competent, and the management of this information must be given to the uh, public organizations, so the government and so on, and uh, uh, maybe in cooperation with private information um, companies uh, that have a lot of resources. So in a way that uh, information could be organized and made accessible and also very useful. And this is a way of uh, generating also literacy among people on the matter, and this can help. And also, I believe that another uh, point, a very important point, it is inclusivity, and it can be based also on the training also of people. And, uh, and this is also connected with ethics and also um, a sustainable development of infrastructure as we were talking before. So also the development of uh, uh, what is needed for the improving of health uh, uh, technology must be based on sustainable development. Okay, these were some comments. Let's... Thank you, Tara. Uh, um, I, I think um, this is, uh, of course, a, a very uh, important aspect uh, that data is becoming more and more important um, for health uh, care. Well, we have um, we have uh, training data for uh, artificial intelligence, but we also have just the normal treatment data, and um, we have data protection laws, but uh, still, it's the same data protection law. For example, we have quite different ways how to treat, uh, for example, vaccination data. Uh, in Denmark, which is part of the EU and uh, subject to the GDPR, we have a public, uh, we have a registered, an official register where it is mandatory to register all vaccinations, including COVID, but uh, all vaccinations. This would be almost not imaginable for, for Germany, for example, where the government currently cannot tell how many people are actually vaccinated? They might say, well, maybe it's 10% more than the figures we have. We just don't know. So this is this is these are two sides how to deal with health data. Um, and um, it, it could be a long discussion just about health data. And uh, thank you for bringing it up. Um, Herman, you, you got another uh, question? Uh, you to Mali. Um, just want to follow up on what Kiara was uh, talking from a finance perspective. Uh, retaining all this data is very important and obviously for risk management and funding for governments uh, or even hospitals or even a you know, dental practice or veterinarian or, or so forth. So the cost of doing all this work is, is very important and the cost of not doing all this work and collaborating and, and putting in uh, good practices and um, and safety measures and so forth, they that cost that. So it's cost benefit is very, very important. And with insurance, uh, as has been brought up, um, you know, we are finding, uh, for instance, information sharing um, on patients, 
um, and uh, you know is of concern to some people uh, because um, you know there have been uh, stories of, of certain uh, groups being being marginalized and so forth. Um, so there is that great need for anonymous patient data, um, especially uh, if there are things like uh, medical trials going on, and and we want to have lots of medical trials that are very inclusive. Uh, of the very diverse global population that we have so that we are ensured that um, you know, vaccines and so forth are effective globally and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm very glad Chiara brought in the accounting concept because cost is everything and, and tends to drive uh, you know, all these matters. So thank you, Chiara, for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amali, um, I'm looking at the time. Um, I would like to have uh, the question of Herman. So, but uh, how how are we doing with time? We are fine. We are right. have half an hour, I think. We have half an hour. So we have until seven p.m. Yes. Okay. So please, Herman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh. I'll just uh, seems like a repetition because all the points that I just uh, uh, sorry, just let me stop here. So I just got a note from the secretariat and um, they're saying that we're now over time. So we had 90 oh, minutes right? allotted for the session. Oh, and okay. so okay. I would um, that's the time I had on my calendar invite as well. So we've okay. reached uh, the end of our time right now. And so um, I'll let the moderator for this question um, maybe wrap up and then we'll go to the closing slides as well. Um, so, uh, so thank you. I, I will uh, wrap up uh, very, um, uh, very uh, briefly. Uh, I think we, we have seen a lot of uh, future issues that uh, have to do with technology, with data, with uh, all kinds of um, um, uh, risks that come through this technology, but also uh, all kinds of benefits that uh, can and uh, maybe used to to solve current issues of um, um, of health, like uh, also like uh, costs, uh, like availability, affordability, um, inclusivity, etc. Uh, so we 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 will have technology as a means to solve things, but also as a um, new troublemaker at the same time. So we we have to um, deal with both sides of the coin. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion, uh, and I give it back to uh, Amali. So Amali, I'll just uh, have the last slide up for you and over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry about our, our own personal disaster here. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, I, I'd just like to uh, you know, thank everybody, but if I mean, if you did have a last point, if you can just say that in a minute, uh, you know, that would be great. Okay, I, I, I apologize, I mean, it seems like uh, we've lost you there. So Robert, uh, over to you, because I, I really can't see anything from this side. Oh, okay, sorry. So our yeah. wrap-up sl slide is here, and so I'm just gonna, uh, let me just go to um, video. Um, hopefully everyone can see me. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for um, bearing with us as we had some technical challenges at the beginning. I'd like to thank um, Amali and the members of the Dynamic Coalition for putting together this um, dynamic exchange and presentation and discussion on four key questions. And um, we'd like um, those who are, are joining us today, if you haven't joined already, to please subscribe to our Dynamic Coalition mailing list, the Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies, DDHT. Um, that is one of the Dynamic Coalitions for the Internet Governance Forum. And so I'd like to thank them and also I'd like to thank the Secretariat staff and others that have joined us today, and those also who uh, were joining us and gave us the questions. With sessions like this, there's always times where you may have questions after the fact, and you may have questions that you've not had a chance to do, or you may not had a chance to share a comment. So please do share, um, keep that in mind, write it down, subscribe to the mailing list where we can continue that discussion. In regards to this discussion, um, it was recorded, um, and the secretariat will share with us the link. I've also, um, will be generating a transcript as well. Also we'll have that as available as well. So I'd like to thank all of you uh, for your time today and um, ask that you all 
also stay safe in these very challenging times. And I look to see all of you um, online soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All the Bye. 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 Thank you, audience joining us. Bye. Bye. Thank you.